Good afternoon, class. Today we're going to be taking notes on the Canterbury's ta Canterbury Tales. Um, we will be reading The Wife of Bath's Tale, which is actually only one of many of the tales um, within this text. And the essential question that we'll be looking at with this story is what is true chivalry? So go ahead and take a second, pause this video, and respond to the following journal prompt. What do you think is the most is most important for a successful romantic relationship. So if you were gonna take a guess on what it means to be a good partner, even a good friend to somebody, um, what is most important to a successful relationship? So go ahead and pause this video and respond to this prompt in your digital notebook. Now that you've done that, we're going to go ahead and continue the notes. The reason why we started with a journal prompt today is because this is to get you thinking about um, some of the ideas we'll explore within this text. So the first thing we're going to look at as we read The Wife of Bath's Tale is analyzing the structure of a text. Now this particular story is part of a frame story or a story that surrounds and binds together one or more different narratives in a single work. I like to think of this, uh, these frame stories as the Russian dolls, where one fits inside another and then another and then another, another until you're left with, you, you know, you start with this really big doll, but you're left with this eeny tiny baby one because they all fit in. Frame story works the same way in the sense that um, there is an outer story and then there's another story that happens inside of that and then another story that happens inside of that. The Canterbury Tales is a frame story that begins with a general prologue in which the characters, setting, and storytelling premise are introduced. So we're not reading the general prologue, but in the prologue it explains who all the characters are, what they're doing, um, and what's going to happen over the course of the story. In this case, our pilgrims are going on a pilgrimage to um, Canterbury just like you would go on a pilgrimage to Mecca. This particular story also includes interactions among characters in the breaks between tales, when they often interrupt and argue with one another, which leads to some great opportunities um, to analyze characterization. Now, in this particular frame story, we go from the outside doll, or the general prologue, to a character story, which would be the next doll, and then we go back to the host who told the general prologue and then back to another character and then back outside and then back into another story and then back out. So we have this hopping in and out, so to speak, of, of this text. Um, this particular uh, story, the one we're reading, The Wife of Bath's Tale, it is a woman who is telling the story, but we still see some interaction between her and some of the other characters that are going on this pilgrimage, um, and we also see some interaction between her and the host. Now I know that I'm moving through these slides, but please, please, please pause the video and take the notes in your interactive notebook, and then, um, you know, unpause and, and continue when you're ready. So the frame story provides a vivid portrait of each pilgrim. Through the initial descriptions, as well as the later interactions among the pilgrims, readers learn about the, about the positions they occupy in medieval society. For example, we have a knight, we have a squire, we have a nun, we have a priest, etc. These interactions enable Chaucer to present insights about practices and institutions of this time period. So part of what Chaucer's doing in this text is he's commenting on the roles that these people play in society. So for example, with the knight, he's going to show us uh, what a knight actually acts like versus how they're supposed to act. And I know we've spoken about this before, um, but you're going to want to pay attention to the differences between how we think a character should act and how they actually act. So consider a knight, for example. How would you expect a knight to behave? Well, we expect him to be chivalrous, 
We expect him to be kind. We expect him to be honorable. Now, if our knight is none of these things or is missing some characteristic, like even if he's not brave, for example, then we might question, why is he a knight? So what is Chaucer trying to say about these people when he makes these characters um, lacking in some way? Chaucer also include, includes the frame story or sorry, uses the frame story to explore the relationships between pilgrims. So we get um, the Miller and the Reeve in this whole series. The Miller and the Reeve are two people in real life, two jobs that would hate one another because they both are trying to cheat the common person. The Reeve steals grain. Um, the Miller, the, the Miller also steals grain. Um, and so they hate one another. So we get to see how the interactions between these these different even social classes and different jobs fare um, within his story, even though it is supposedly not true. The second thing we're going to do in the story is analyze the narrator. Now, the narrator is the character or voice that tells the story's events to the reader. It's the person that's telling us the story. But in this case, we have multiple narrators. Multiple, multiple narrators are used to do different things. For example, we have the host who narrates the descriptions of the each person going on this pilgrimage, each character for us. And then we have the, the characters who are telling their own stories and they narrate their own story. So the narrator of the frame story describes the pilgrims and records their exchanges with one another, meaning their dialogue. And the pilgrims, in turn, narrate their own tales. Now with the wife of Bath's tale, she is going to tell a story that she says she's highly qualified for. When we're analyzing the narrator, we're going to do it through the following elements. The first is subject and theme. When narrators are also characters in a story, they usually choose subjects and themes relevant to their own experiences. In the example of the wife of Bath, um, she has been married five times. Now, because she's been married five times, she says she is an expert with uh, marital relationships. Um, so she tells a story that has to deal with relationships. We're also going to look at direct statements. Narrators sometimes comment directly on characters and events. They can specifically say, hey, this character is blah, 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 or this person is blah, blah, blah. Lastly, we'll look at tone. A narrator's tone or attitude towards a subject provides cues about the narrator's personality. Usually tone is communicated through word choice and details. Um, so we're looking for hints of how is this person speaking about another person. In, in the example of the host that I gave earlier, if the host is talking about a knight and he's describing the knight as, as not being a wholesome person, then that tells us how the host feels about this specific person. Now in our story, subject and theme, the wife of Bath, who has been married five times, tells a story about relationships between men and women. So we're gonna look at her story and what the message of her story is as we read it. So just to give you um, a head start on what to be looking for as we read. In terms of direct statements, the wife of Bath makes statements on several topics, such as the type of husband she values and the ability of women to keep secrets. So she specifically gives details about certain things. In terms of tone, notice the words the wife of, the Bath, wife of Bath uses to describe the knight's plight or the knight's um, predicament. What kind of person comes across through, through his tone, through her tone, sorry. So based on how the wife of Bath talks about the knight, what kind of person do you think the knight is? 
How do you think she feels about the night? In terms of language, we're going to be looking at inverted sentences. Inverted sentences are sentences in which the normal order of a subject followed by a verb is reversed. So example, but truly poor are they who whine and fret, meaning those who whine and fret are truly poor. So normally we have our, our subject and then our verb, but in this case, um, we have the opposite. We have truly poor. These we're, we're describing these people as poor, which is a verb. And then we have our subject who whine and fret. When you think about inverted sentences, the easiest one, to, uh, the easy example to think of is Yoda. Yoda speaks in inverted sentences. So named must your fear be before banish it you can. I mean, I don't have a good Yoda voice, but you get the point. So that backward sort of way that Yoda speaks, that those are inverted sentences. Now you have five critical vocabulary words for this text. Preamble, virtue, sovereignty, bequeath, and rebuke. These are the five words you're going to need to, to understand for this text. Now, take a second, pause this video, and do your best to fill in what words should go in each of these sentences. So use your context clues to determine which of these words should go into these sentences. So sentence one, the wife of Bath chose some of her husbands based on what they could blank to her. Nun's habits are designed to reflect the blank and modesty of the wearer. Since the wife of Bath has blank over her financial affairs, she can spend her money on whatever she likes. The friar objected to the lengthy blank to the wife of Bath's tale. And lastly, the summoner responded to the friar's comments with a blank. So take a couple moments, put these sentences in your notebook, and um, complete the sentence using one of these vocabulary words. Now that you've done that, let's look at what you let's look at what you did versus what you should have done. So in the first one, um, bequeath. So let's look at this sentence. The wife of Bath chose some of her husbands based on what they could bequeath her. So based on this sentence, what do you think the word bequeath means? If you said give her, then you're correct. Number two is virtue. So the nun's habits are designed to reflect the virtue and modesty of the, of the wearer. What do you think virtue means in this sentence? If you said something related to somebody's moral standards, then you're correct. The answer to three is sovereignty. So since the wife of Bath has sovereignty over her financial affairs, she can spend her money on whatever she likes. What do you think sovereignty means in terms of this sentence using context clues? If you said supreme power or power over her financial affairs, then you're absolutely correct. Sovereignty means power. Preamble. The friar objected to the lengthy preamble to the wife of Bath's tale. What do you think preamble means? So in this sentence, preamble means the bit that comes before. So before the real thing. Pre means before. So he's talking about the, um, the, the message she gives before she starts telling her tale. Now lastly, the summoner responded to the friar's comments with a rebuke. What does rebuke mean in this sentence? If 
If you said disapproval or criticism, then you're absolutely correct. Rebuke means um, to disapprove of. So that's it for these particular notes. Um, the next thing I want you to do is go to your digital notebook and look on slide 31 where you have this chart that says analyze the narrator. Now we're going to start reading on Sunday of our next class, but I want you to get an idea of what is going to be expected from you um, as we read. So as you read this particular text, you are going to analyze the narrator. So you'll be filling out this chart based on what we read and what it's asking you. So for subject and theme, when narrators are also characters in a story, they usually choose subjects and themes relevant to their own experiences. For example, the wife of Bath, who has been married five times, tells a tale about relationships between men and women. Take notes, it should say in the right column, sorry about that, in the right column. So anything about subject and theme um, that you think is relevant to analyzing the narrator, you're going to make some notes here. Same with direct statements and with tone. So remember, when we start reading in class on Sunday, you are going to be filling out this chart as we read. Okay? So that's all I have for you guys today. I hope you have a lovely weekend, and I look forward to seeing you on Sunday. Have a great weekend.